Research Unit of the University of Cyprus. Turning from the Aegean to the archaeology of Cyprus, it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce our today's speaker, Dr. Francesca Meneghetti, a non-stipendiary research fellow at the Archaeological Research Unit of the University of Cyprus. Francesca Meneghetti undertook her undergraduate studies at the University of Pavia, where she received a bachelor's degree in classical and Near Eastern antiquities, and her graduate studies at the University of Turin, where she completed her MA in archaeology and ancient history. Dr. Meneghetti received her PhD in prehistory and protohistory from Goethe University in October 2020. Her thesis re-examined miniature oxide ingots from late Bronze Age Cyprus, their archaeological context and functions using archaeological approaches and miniaturization theories borrowed from anthropology and sociology. For her dissertation, she won the Christa Verhang Prize of the Association of the Friends and Patrons of Goethe University. Francesca recently published a monograph stemming from a doctoral dissertation titled Miniature Oxide Ingots from Late Bronze Age Cyprus, an update on the material. From 2016 to 2019, she was research associate in the training in the research training group Value and Equivalence, funded by Dev Gay and based at Goethe University. For her doctoral and current work, she undertook several research stays in Cyprus at the, Ameri at the Cyprus American Archaeological research, research Institute and the Cyprus Museum and in other European museums to study their collections. She has participated in several international conferences and workshops, both as speaker and, public, and, and pub panel organizer. As graduate students, she joined archaeological excavations in Italy and Cyprus. Her scholarly interests focus on late Bronze Age Cyprus, material culture, interregional contacts, the study and publication of material from old excavations. Her research combines archaeological analysis with theories and approaches from other disciplines, mainly anthropology and sociology. Following the defense of her PhD thesis, Francesca continues to study miniatures and miniaturization phenomena in late Bronze Age Cyprus, while she currently focuses on the re-examination of the so-called miniature pottery from Athienu Pambularitis Cucuminas. Together with Enrico de Benedictis, PhD candidate at the University of Cyprus, she currently works on the study of the archival material of the French mission at Encomi. Closing this introduction, I would like to remind everyone to keep their microphones um, muted and switch off their cameras. Should you wish to address a question or comment to our speaker, feel free to use the chat button on Zoom. You may also switch on your cameras after the end of the presentation to address your question directly to the speaker by raising your hand and unmuting your microphone. Dear Francesca, we look forward to hearing about your research on miniature oxide ingots from late Bronze Age Cyprus. My colleague, Georgos Papasavas, and I will coordinate the Q&A session following your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Professor Svians. I will just share my screen. Okay. Oh. Work. <laughs> Try again. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, that's right. Oh. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, so, as I, um, as Professor Sviani uh, just said, I will present you um, uh, the results of my PhD uh, research. So, just let's start and jump into the topic. So, miniature oxide ingots. Uh, have been uh, the focus of a relatively small scholarly debate, which traditionally interpreted them as votives. However, after more than 60 years from the first study, they might benefit from being looked at differently. In order to, uh, to offer an updated view on the material, the lecture combines the analysis of archaeological context, where the miniature oxide ingots come from, with miniaturization theories. 
The aim is to solve part of the issues arising from the debate and mark the materials features that were neglected or not considered before, shedding new light possibly on these artifacts. Um, notwithstanding the presence in the Mediterranean basin of hundreds of full-size oxide ingots of Cypriot origin, scholars have never analyzed the miniature ones in great detail. Moreover, perhaps surprisingly, uh, their small size is an aspect that the debate concerning their possible function has never properly, properly explored. So despite some renewed interest, miniature oxide ingots, as I said, uh, remained relatively little studied. Unlike other categories of late Cypriot materials, they do not constitute a large corpus of objects, numbering only 14 to date. The shortage of material seems to have discouraged new studies and held back um, scholarly discussion. Uh, previous scholars have tended to assign just one interpretation to all miniature oxide ingots without assessing their archaeological context and the peculiarities of the single artifact. If on the one hand, their archaeological contexts are secondary, on the other, their missed analysis resulted in a false uniformity of the corpus. Um, as in every research, there have been problems related to the material studied and the history of the research itself. As stated above, we are dealing with secondary context, while other pieces come from the antiquity market or do not originate from scientific excavations. Within the corpus, the miniature ingots from Ancomi may be seen as a special case, given the history of its excavations and the, the partial publication of the site and uh, the material. Another problem is research miniaturization. So the scholarship on this topic is very limited, not only in archaeology, but also in the humanities in general. This is probably because it's a recent field of research grown only in the past 15 years. With some exceptions, archaeology lacks theoretical studies of miniaturization. When archaeologists debate um, miniatures, the discussion is frequently biased. To further complicate the picture, when miniatures are identified in archaeological excavations, they are regularly interpreted as low quality copies or full size artifacts aimed at lower social strata or as objects without an utilitarian function. This is an economical view that, however, does not always correspond to the archaeological and historical data. Moreover, it fails to recognize the peculiarity of the miniatures and evaluate them, adopting an etching approach toward the subject. So that said, let's jump into the topic. Um, copper was one of the most important and wanted products of Cyprus during the late Bronze Age. And oxide ingots, because of their wide distribution, embody at best uh, this research. They were also the form uh, in which Cypriot copper mainly circulated in the Mediterranean basin. It is maybe for this reason that this peculiar shape becomes part not only of the economy, but also of the material culture of late Bronze Age Cyprus. In fact, a variety of objects depicting oxide ingots appeared in Cypriot material culture from the 13th century BC um, till the end of the Bronze Age. Cylinder seals, four sided stands, bronze figurines, and miniature oxide ingots are an example of this tendency. As said, to date, there exist 40 miniature oxide ingots known to have come from Cyprus, and they are dated between the 13th and 11th century BC. In this first slide, you can see that uh, the, the first nine pieces, and um, they all come from reliable context, six from Mancomi. The first row uh, come from uh, the Dikius excavation, uh, while the second row come from um, the French excavations. At the bottom left corner, you can see the piece from Alas Apano Mandilaris, uh, while uh, in the uh, right uh, bottom corner, you can see the two pieces from Pila Kokinokrimos. Um, the other pieces, unfortunately, um, come from a reliable uh, fine spots, uh, namely Matiatis, which are is um, the one from the Swedish Cyprus expedition, which is now stored in Stockholm. Uh, this one at the center was acquired from the antiquity market by the uh, Cyprus Museum in 
1936. And in this column, you can see um, what I call the Colocacidus zygote. Um, here you can see uh, the first sketch made by Schaeffer in his 1953 publication. Um, this is the picture that uh, Buchholz uh, published after 50 years of the zingot, and this is the picture that come from that comes from uh, Buchholz archive. And I really need to thank Matthias Reke for digging through Buchholz archive and uh, passing me uh, the material. So as you can see, all of these are really particular, but they do not come from uh, archaeological excavations or from reliable uh, contexts. Um, six of these miniatures are made of very pure copper, while five are made of bronze. Uh, four pieces, three from Mancomi and uh, one from uh, unknown provenance, there are no inscriptions. In terms of dimensions, it is clear that this small corpus lacks uniformity. Each ingot has a slightly different oxide shape and their length uh, changes from two centimeters to 11 centimeters. Their weight ranges from four to a maximum of 240 grams. So a quite uh, reduction from the full size oxide ingots, which are 30 kilos and they, their length is uh, between 20 and 45 centimeters. Um, leaving aside the problem of uh, secondary depositions, the archaeological context of these objects, when reliable, also varies uh, greatly. Uh, we can find uh, residential and domestic areas, like the pieces uh, from Ankumi, especially uh, these two from the French excavations, which come from Porter through West. And uh, the, this piece also from uh, French excavations, which come from quarter five west. And also uh, Encomi 1995, which comes from uh, Dekius excavations and were found, was found in uh, uh, level 2B building of quarter uh, five, uh, four west. Um, there are also metal hordes in uh, mining areas. Uh, especially in this case, it's the Matiasis pieces, and then workshops uh, and industrial areas. And these are the pieces from uh, Pila. Then there are possible mixed work cultic areas. And those are the pieces from Alasa and uh, Ankomi uh, 885. So Ankomi 885 is this one, and Alasa is, is this one, and it was found in room P. <clears throat> so, as shown above, the material presents the scholar with numerous research problems. First of all, it is not always possible to ascertain the provenance of the pieces because some come from the antiquity market or from old excavations. Moreover, when the fine spot is reliable, it is often unclear, preventing uh, to know the original context and also function of the object. Then, forming a group only of just 14 objects, they are not numerous enough to allow a complete overview or statistical analysis, for example, on their weight. Uh, on the other hand, there are other factors that make miniature oxide ingots deserving a further reinvestigation. Some of the miniatures by recognizable cipriminon signs a characteristic rarely seen on the full size counterparts. This seems to indicate that they had a different purpose compared with the latter. In the end, the discovery of pieces made of uh, bronze provided a new perspective on the metal composition uh, of these artifacts and therefore also of their function. So from the 16th century, you see super copper mainly circulated in the form of oxide ingots. Then at the end of the 11th century, we see Oxide ingots disappeared from archaeological and iconographical records, while cypriot copper continued to be exported and traded. Therefore, oxide ingots and their depictions were restricted to specific times and circumstances, which possibly indicate a specific historic and social background. And this background could be found in late cypriot society and the changes it underwent at the end of the second millennium BC. So as I said, to better understand the function and therefore the role of miniature oxide ingots, I adopted an interdisciplinary 
planning approach that combines the re-examination of past interpretations attributed to this object, the archaeological and socio-historical contextualization of the pieces, and miniaturization theories. So, so moving to the current interpretations given to the pieces. So Buchholz initially described miniature oxide ingots as objects, uh, I quote, without practical value, but with religious significance. In particular, he considered one of the supermino inscriptions to be a dedication formula. His interpretation became the most accepted and still it is, especially after the discovery of the statue of the ingot god and his sanctuary. The first um, scholar to argue against Buchholz's hypothesis was Webb. She correctly pointed out that among the miniature ingots, only two could have come from possible ritual or cultic settings. And these are the piece from Alasa and one piece from Enkumi, Enkumi 885. These two ingots could originate from environments which show both ritual and domestic or ritual and working feature. However, it will follow below a more in-depth analysis of the actual nature of their finding places. Moving to the next interpretation, Cassinidu, who agreed with Webb, suggested that miniature oxide ingots might have served as weights. However, no metrological study has been done so far, and the actual weights of these objects have um, never been yet compared to any known metrological system in use in the late Bronze Age Eastern Mediterranean. Lately, Ferrar and Bell interpretation um, is the most recent one, and according to them, miniature oxide ingots were copper samples. In particular, the presence of cypermine inscriptions would have been a guarantee of the quality and secret provenance of the copper. Albeit intriguing, this argument raises um, some issues which I briefly mention here and then I will examine below. First of all, even though we have made notable progresses, cypermine on script remains under secret. And second, Ferrara and Bell failed to take into account the existence of uninscribed copper miniatures and also bronze ones. <clears throat> so moving to the reinterpretations and to the reanalysis of them. So as I said, although Buchholz's interpretations of miniature ingots as votive is still the most widely accepted, um, it doesn't seem tenable at least for all the pieces. So first of all, he considered only the inscribed pieces without explaining the others. And when he wrote his article in 1959, um, there were already two plain miniature oxide ingots um, discovered. Second, even though the ingot god might have embodied divine protection of oxide ingots and therefore of late Cypriot um, copper industry, Analysis of the archaeological context of miniature oxide ingots do not allow to contextualize all the pieces in a religious or ritual setting. As I said, um, among the 14 pieces, just two, the one from Alasa and Enkomi 8A5, could have come from such environment, but neither bears Cyprimin on signs. Uh, so in order to ascertain whether they are votives, their, their finding places deserve better analysis. Um, according to Webb, um, there are specific features that characterize public and communal um, late Cypriot uh, cultic sites. Here, I'll really briefly summarize them. Um, and these are specifically uh, that a cultic site needs to be set in a special um, building uh, set apart from secular ones. Um, there should be public and or hidden practices taking place in this space. Um, the cultic space uh, has to have special facilities for rituals, such as benches, altars, basins, pits. Um, there should be the presence of portable cult equipment and remains of offerings, sacrifices and votives. Presence also of ritual iconography and cult images, investment of wealth and resources in facilities, equipment, and also offerings. So um, if we really go into deep um, uh, to see the context of these two ingots, it might be that uh, they 
don't come from a ritual or religious context, uh, neither public nor domestic, because their find spots um, do not show clear features of uh, late Bronze Age Cypriot cultic sites. So starting with Alasa, um, according to Ajisavas, uh, the miniature ingots, um, Alasa uh, 1984-3, uh, could come from a, a ritual space, which however shows also domestic and working features. The excavator considered room P, where the miniature ingot was found, um, as a domestic shrine, or more recently, I quote, a cult space within an industrial complex. The discovery of four bull figurines and an incense burner in the room was the main basis for his argument. However, is it possible to apply Webb's criteria to the three room complex, which is uh, beta, alpha, and P, to prove that room P was a cult space? So since ceramic evidence from the room alpha is almost impossible to use because it's too scarce, I consider the materials from the other two rooms, from room beta and P. The predominance of walls and jug and juglets in room beta and P fits what Webb's understanding uh, with Webb's understanding of ceramics from a cult building. The presence of P3 may also be indicative of cultic practices, although they might simply be evidence of storage activities. On the other hand, cooking pots and telastra suggest domestic activities. Although the majority of the pottery could imply the existence of a cult space, there are no animal bones or architectural features to support this in this area. The excavators did not detect benches, altars, lotter tables, or aduta also. There is only the hearth in room alpha. One might argue that the incense burner, the bull figurines, and the miniature oxide ingot found in room P um, are sufficient evidence of the, the presence of a cult space. Um, but even though we were to go back to interpret the room as a domestic cult space, it would be difficult to distinguish between a normal household area and a domestic cultic one because the qualities that identify communal cult places such as separateness and specialization are not readily uh, detectable. Moreover, cult activities in domestic contexts might not clearly be distinguished from normal household uh, actions. Um, nonetheless, um, if a uh, uh, cult takes place inside the house, this is usually performed in a delimited space within the structure, such as a room or part of a room then there should be specific artifacts not commonly present in secular context and used as symbolic focus of the cult or as cult equipment. So although we cannot completely exclude the enactment of rituals in this three room complex, if we follow Renfrew, which, um, which suggested the criteria for domestic cult places, neither room P nor beta or alpha seem to have had secluded areas or places where a domestic cult could have taken place. On the other hand, we cannot also eliminate the possibility that the unit made up uh, of rooms beta alpha p could have had a working character, character which would fit with what is known of the surrounding areas. So for example, here there are installations for um, clay working, and here there is the installation for oil production, and also here. Uh, there is um, evidence of metallurgical activities. So again, it's quite uh, debatable. Moving to um, Ancomi 885, as I said, this ingot was found um, in the reconstructed Ashlar building, so in quarter five west, the four west of Ancomi, between floor four and 3A of room uh, 44. Uh, during level uh, 3B, this is room 44. Dicius briefly described this in the intermediate level as containing ashes, and together with the miniature ingot, there were other objects recovered from the same layer, a bronze knife, a fragmentary rutan in the shape of a bull's head, a stone pestle, a stone bead, and a terracotta loom weight, and a bone weaving too. Um, it is likely that the miniature ingot, since it's an intermediate, it's a mixed uh, and intermediate floor, 
um, originates from a floor of level 3B preceding floor 3A, or even from a level 3A context. Um, according to Webb, the objects found together with uh, ENCOMI 885 could be considered related to the cult unit in the southern sector. We should not forget that here there is, um, uh, there is the sanctuaries of the horn god and the double goddess. Webb also suggested that the northern part of the reconstructed Ashland building, uh, seemingly domestic, given its features, might be related to everyday life of the people employed in the sanctuary of the whole god and the double goddess. However, um, there is no evidence that um, this miniature oxide ingots was strictly part of the rituals connected either with the old god or with the double goddess, because Similarly, there is no connection between this, this part of the building and the remaining uh, part of the structure. Judging by the deposition of the miniature ingot, the terminus antequem from, for its last use was presumably a uh, floor four, as I said. Um, keeping in mind that the centuries of the Roman gods was installed later on uh, floor three, the deposition of the miniature ingot therefore predates the cult in the southern part of the Ashlar building, because floor four of room 44 predates floor three of the sanctuaries, if we follow uh, the stratigraphy uh, identified by Mount Joy. Of course, we cannot exclude that some rituals uh, could have also taken place um, during, uh, before floor three, both in the southern part and northern part of the site. So I asked to myself whether the material and architectural evidence um, during uh, floor uh, five and four of room 44 uh, would again indicate a ritual or profane setting um, of, uh, this part, uh, of this part of, uh, of the structure. So um, I don't have time here to go deep into the analysis, but there are some pieces that might hint at a cultic space, but again, the material uh, of floor five and four of room 44 and also 41 um, is too scant to certainly interpret room 44 and 41 as connected to the religious activities in the Southern part of the Ashlar building, activities that moreover, as I said, started later in floor three. So with the possible exception of the fragmentary uh, terracotta bull roton, which was found together with the miniature ingot, all the artifacts from the intermediate stratum uh, where the miniature ingots originates could also have been common in domestic contexts. Um, so the bone tool and the terracotta loom weight may be indicative of weighing activities, while the stone pestle the bronze knife and the whetstone might suggest food processing, as the as might the dump of uh, as the dump of uh, animal bones in room forty four might also indicate. Not only objects, but also interior furniture and architecture might exclude the interpretation of rooms forty four and forty one as a cultic menu. Between floor five and three a, there were three hearts, one pit, and two walls. Although these were cost and features in late Cypriot religious buildings, they were common in domestic contexts as well. Moreover, neither the hearts nor the pit contain animal bones that might suggest sacrifices. The only animal bones from floor four were found in room 41, which is right at the south uh, of room 44 and communicating with room 44. Um, but these animal bones uh, remain unidentified. Furthermore, the wells uh, were not enclosed in a well annex, uh, unlike was uh, what Webb noted in other uh, late Cypriot cultic spaces. So um, the architecture, the interior furnishing and residual material finds do not further prove that rooms 44 and 41 were cultic and therefore um, that the miniature oxide ingot had a similar function. Moreover, if floor four of room 41 predated floor three of the sanctuaries, then the ingot cannot even be considered contemporary with the sanctuaries in the southern part of the building 
and on this basis linked to a general cultic environment. On the whole, um, it could be argued that neither the miniature ingot from Alassa nor um, Encomi 885 came from a clear cultic or ritual spaces. Um, although their finding places and secondary contexts make it difficult to assign them a precise function, considering Webb and Renfrew's criteria for um, cultic spaces and the above reappraisal of the archaeological context, a votive function of these two miniature ingots cannot be ascertained. So as for the second interpretation that awaits, um, the problem is that no metrological study has yet been performed on these um, ingots. Um, when Jumlia Mayer and others um, analyzed uh, the chemical composition of the miniature ingots stored at the Salpirs Museum, um, they also listed their ways. However, they did not propose any metrological approach. And after measuring and weighing them, uh, they stated that, I quote, variations in both size and weight are too great uh, to allow to consider them as uh, weights. And indeed, the small statistical sample represented by these miniature ingots does not allow to apply metrological analysis. And until late Cypri metrology remains so understudied, um, it would be really difficult to, um, to confirm or discard this interpretation. And also we lack material to enlarge our uh, corpus of, um, of miniature ingots and therefore to um, perform better analysis on uh, better metrological analysis on them. So the latest interpretation is that of Ferrara and, uh, and Bell. And uh, they suggested that miniature oxide ingots were commercial samples. Um, this hypothesis is mainly based on their interpretation of uh, cipramion science on three miniature ingots, um, uh, specifically um, the, the one uh, from the Cyprus Museum uh, acquired from the antiquity market and um, NCOMI 53.2 uh, and 53.3 from the French excavations at NCOMI. Uh, you can see here in the circles uh, the sequence of signs that uh, they uh, uh, examined. Um, so according to, to them, the signs might have indicated the quality of the copper exported by probably by the Cypriots. And uh, since these uh, ingots um, uh, have um, shared this sequence of signs, uh, Ferrar and Bell proposed that um, this sequence um, probably transmitted the same message, um, a sort of brand or written uh, trademark. Um, so Ferrar and Bell interpretation is very fascinating, um, not least because it offers an alternative to the votive function, which might not be valid, uh, as I showed above, but uh, it shows some issues. So first of all, as I uh, already said, Cipriminoan has not been deciphered yet, and therefore the reading of the science remains speculative, as Ferrar and Bell themselves admitted. Moreover, um, Ferrar and Bell based their theory only on described uh, miniature oxide ingots, um, however, it should be remembered that there are there is one plain uh, in, uh, plain specimen made of copper, and also um, that therefore it cannot be interpreted as copper samples on the basis of the presence of cipriminon signs. And also, they did not mention the miniature ingots made of bronze, uh, which numbered five in total and four uh, were already published when they wrote the paper. Um, so since these pieces uh, existed in the Bronze Age Cyprus, this weakens their hypothesis because such pieces cl clearly cannot be copper samples. Another issue is how a metal sample works. Uh, nowadays, we use scientific techniques that allow to assay the purity and chemical composition of a given metal or artifact. Uh, other techniques, such as fire assay and touching, um, have been used since antiquity to assay the presence of 
noble metals like gold and silver in ores and uh, alloys. Uh, and all these techniques doesn't, don't um, need the sample to be um, uh, of a specific uh, shape. Um, so uh, if the dealer is experienced enough, he might recognize the quality of the merchandise of the metal just by looking at it or using these uh, techniques. Um, if we move to a uh, late Bronze Age uh, environment, um, we, we don't know, of course, uh, because we don't have archaeological or written evidence of sampling and assaying techniques for the late Bronze Age. But we can envisage that merchants were probably um, able to judge the value uh, of goods um, back in that period through techniques such as fire assay and touching, or simply by looking at the merchandise, uh, at the metal. Uh, for example, um, Andrew Bevan suggested that a personal visual examination of uh, a metal ingot uh, of its surface and texture would have told the dealer a lot about the overall quality uh, of the metal that the ingot carried. Traders would have been also able to identify the production techniques just by looking at the irregular pitted surface of an oxide ingot, and uh, they would have been they would be able also to ascertain the worth um, of uh, the metal just by checking uh, a small portion of the, smet the metal slab if uh, the, uh, the ingot was transported in a broken or fragmented um, state. So. Uh, if we accept that uh, late Bronze Age metal traders were able to appreciate the quality of a commodity from a vision examination alone, the interpretation of uh, miniature oxide ingots as copper samples might not make sense. Furthermore, given the purity of these artifacts, it would have been a waste of both human and economic resources, manufacturing samples that could not be inspected uh, because they were carried complete and whose production technique was probably different from that of full size oxide ingots. So although we cannot complete validate um, or dismiss these interpretations, it is clear that all three considered miniature ingots as a unified corpus, while they are not as such. Indeed, each miniature uh, has to be contextualized in the site and context where it was found. If if we apply this approach, we can see that miniature oxide ingots are far from being a compact corpus and that each site and related inhabitants might have used them differently. Um, before proposing um, the uh, uh, reassessed archaeological context, um, a brief caveat is necessary. As I said, the prominence pieces come from secondary depositions and their original context and also function remains unknown. Therefore, also the interpretation that I will suggest are based um, on secondary context. And of course, this is, I know that this is a research issue, but uh, these secondary depositions are the only archeological evidence available. So, after the reassessment proposed above uh, about the pieces from the piece from Alasa and uh, the one from Ankumi, um, I narrowed down uh, uh, the uh, archaeological um, context uh, to uh, three different um, areas. So uh, residential domestic areas, metal hordes in uh, mining areas, and also uh, working um, uh, context and uh, workshop industrial areas. Um, the, this reassessment of the archeological context also allows uh, to determine the chronology of uh, some pieces, namely those with a reliable fine spot. In some cases, the definition of a time frame is easier, whereas in others, this is more difficult, sometimes due to the nature of the site itself. For example, Alas Apanomandilaris and Pila Cochinocremos were abandoned and therefore the lifespan of the settlements can be more easily ascertained, uh, namely between the LC2C and LC3A. And Kumi was also gradually abandoned at the end of the LC3B. 
However, due to the history of its excavations, it is difficult to have a comprehensive overview of the site and its stratigraphy and also of these finds. Um, according to my analysis of the archaeological context, Ancomi 1995 um, is the oldest, uh, was last used in the position date back uh, to the LC2C, while Ancomi 59.9 follows being dated to the late LC2C uh, uh, or the beginning of LC3A. Encomi 8A5 uh, and um, Encomi 53.2 and 53.3 uh, might have been deposited uh, in at some point in the LC3B. And the last miniature ingot from Encomi, Encomi 774, was found unfortunately in a poorly preserved level dated to uh, the late LC3B in level uh, 3C. Um, so the archaeological, um, the, the reassessment of the archaeological context solved um, some issues, not, not everything. So what I did next is to go deep into the late Cypriot society and its material culture. Um, so we know that copper played an important role as prestigious material for great part of the Cypriot uh, Bronze Age and at least until the Middle Bronze Age. However, at the beginning of the Late Bronze Age, local Cypriot elites do not seem to consider uh, copper the right material for the social display. Instead of copper, other materials such as gold, silver and imported luxury objects and exotica arrived on Cyprus in exchange of copper and are used by local elites to show and consolidate their power. At the end of the 13th century, and in particular at Ancomi, copper and bronze regain importance in the social display, as the higher presence of copper and copper-based artifacts in the mortuary record could indicate. From the uh, 12th century on, the richer burials have an impressive array of bronze artifacts, together with elaborate ivory objects and jewelry. So it seems that Ancomi elites revaluated copper and copper-based artifacts, which are now part of uh, their status symbols. How to put Ancomi miniature ingots in, in this um, uh, background? So uh, the last use and deposition of uh, Ancomi 1995, um, you see here, dated to the LC2C, and Ancomi 59.9, dated to, uh, to the late LC2C and the beginning of LC3, could be set within the start of this revaluation process, while Ancomi 53.2, 53.3, and 885 might come from a later period, namely LC3B, when Ancomi elites had fully reassessed copper and was employing it as an important element in social display. It might not be a case that 12th century Ancomi was characterized by prominent buildings such as Level 3B Ashlar building and the Sanctuary of the Ingot God in quarter four, um, uh, five east. In this social setting, miniature ingots might have been prestige objects in premise on account of their metal composition and in some cases on account of the presence of superminal inscriptions, which could also have enhanced their functions uh, as valuable items. These miniature ingots could, have, could be part of an elite ideology, which was economy based. Copper was the good that allowed Ancomi and local elites to survive the crisis and thrive after it. Different groups uh, might have used uh, miniature ingots to underline their power and control over copper. As tangible symbols of power, these objects would have been useful to affirm the economic and also social influence of a certain elite group. If we think that I, I can seize and show what brings me power, then my status and authority are more easily legitimized. So it is in this context that, uh, context that I used uh, miniaturization uh, to uh, help to understand better the function of, um, of these uh, miniatures. So um, it doesn't exist a standardized scholarly definition of uh, what a miniature is. 
however, we can state in general terms that a miniature is a small object with a similar bigger counterpart. Um, however, a miniature works differently from its prototype. And since the dimension uh, are reduced, the miniature develops its own functions uh, that make uh, the miniature object um, acting differently from the bigger counterpart. According to the anthropologist Jack Davy, miniaturization is a communicative process in which the miniature is the catalyst of this uh, communication activity. This process works because miniatures have affordances. Um, three elements, which are the basis of Davy's miniaturization model, express uh, the affordances, and these are mimesis, scaling, and simplification. Mimesis creates between miniature and prototype both an iconic and indexical link. Scaling refers to the dimension of reduction of, uh, that an object has to undergo to be considered a miniature. Scaling is also important because it enables the tactile engagement with a miniature. As for simplification, miniatures are usually less complex and detailed than the prototype. However, this affects only their appearance and not the technical production. In fact, although the aspect of the miniature seems simpler than the counterpart, the same might not be valid for its manufacture. Because of its reduced dimensions, a miniature could need better skills and bigger technical efforts to be created. Um, therefore, thanks to size and affordances, a miniature object allows a closer engagement between the object itself and the viewer uh, and the transmission of messages between these two parts. The affordances can provoke in the viewer individual and often emotional reactions to affordances them, themselves, and these are called qualia. And because of affordances and qualia and the close engagement with the miniature, a person is able to assign a meaning to the miniature that he or she is touching. Um, since both miniature and audience also live in the same um, semiotic ideology, so in the same um, sign uh, environment, um, symbol environment, the person interacting with the miniature is also able to understand the miniature and uh, to understand also its affordances and therefore to react to them. Um, the um, other two theories that I applied um, are those uh, offered, proposed by Sheila Koring and, um, and Langi Hooper. So Sheila Koring uh, based uh, her theory on Alfred uh, Gell's uh, theory of enchantment and focuses on the techniques employed during the production of miniatures and on their role in the uh, human perception of uh, miniatures. According to, to Gell, art expressions or objects are part of a technical system defined technology of enchantment. The technical processes behind the creation of an item give it power and imbue it with enchantment uh, and, um, and magic, charming at the same time the viewer. This theory um, also focuses on the relationship between artists, audience, and artwork. The agency of the artist influences whoever sees the artwork, which mediates and creates a bond between artist and viewer. Drawing from uh, Gell's uh, theory, Coring uh, miniaturization theory recognizes miniatures as objects which have specific aesthetic qualities, namely size and detail, uh, that consequently generate enchantment in the viewer. Miniatures uh, affect the observer who feels empowered by uh, their manipulation of the miniature. In this case, the body plays an important role being be involved at both uh, at a sensual and uh, production level. Through the hands, a person is more intimately connected to the production and manipulation of the miniature, interacted with, a, uh, with and being charmed by the artifact. Therefore, thanks to the physical abilities and technical qualities employed in the miniaturization process, the miniature becomes an enchanted object, which likewise charms uh, the observer. Similar uh, to Coring, Langin Hooper designed a miniaturization theory which relies on enchantment and the power felt by a person handling the miniature. Um, for Langin Hooper, there are three reasons why humans are fascinated with miniatures. 
first of all, there are small, there are small dimensions to reassure us and make us feel enlarged. Then an unpredictability in our interaction with miniatures is also part of their appeal. And thirdly, we're fascinated by the tiny because their physical features could not go beyond, uh, could go beyond our senses. Indeed, it is the combination of reduced dimensions and physical features that makes um, the miniature to have such a strong influence on the viewer. In particular, the size and the need to keep the miniature close to the body um, play an important role in creating intimacy between the server and the miniature itself. In this closeness, touch is pivotal because it encourages the handling and the appreciation of miniature. Thus, as a result of its tactility, miniatures fascinate whoever handles them. Once there is close engagement, the miniature is able to provoke enchantment and empowerment in whoever interacts with it. So said that, uh, let's apply this to, to, to Ankumi. So following Davy, Ankumi miniature ingots have affordances given by scaling, mimesis, and simplification. Oxide shape, metal composition, uh, reduced dimensions, smooth surface, and sometimes the Cipriminon uh, inscriptions are the affordances that generate in the viewer qualia. To be understood, affordances and qualia should be located in a semiotic ideology. And with, if we understand the cultural context where the miniaturization takes place, we will also know the semiotic ideology in which miniature ingots um, circulated. Um, in the case of Ankumi, an external social and economic crisis, uh, as the one uh, happening at the end of the 13th century BC and uh, the uh, beginning of the 1st century BC, a more widespread metallurgical activity of the site, uh, showed by the dispersal of um, metallurgical finds, are a new interest in copper-based objects, then imports and oxide ingot iconography characterize Ankumi cultural context. This is the base for the, base for the semiotic ideology where artisans, audience, and miniature ingots interacted. Who created the miniature ingots, knew the counterparts, the oxide shape, and sometimes supremino. They lived and worked inside Ankumi semiotic ideology as well as the people commissioning the miniatures one. Um, having looked at the cultural context of Ankumi miniature ingots and their semiotic ideology, um, we need also to examine their role as communicative um, objects. Although we cannot estimate how often and in which occasion people had interacted with uh, miniature ingots, we could imagine how people interacted with them. A person could have had a miniature in their hands turned it, examined it closer, and showed it to other people. In this way, the possible messages of the miniature ingot could have traveled from the object to the owner and from the owner to the viewers. The affordances of the miniature ingots could have generated in the Ankumi viewer sensual relations or qualia, such as intimacy, fascination, and enchantment, as Coring and Langin Hooper proposed in their works about miniaturization. Mm. Therefore, miniature ingots might have validated the person possessing them, both socially and economically. Thanks to the communicative features of the miniatures, the, the processor can convey power and control messages. The fact that he could physically hold in his hands the thing that gave him his economic and social power, in this case, the metallurgical industry embodied by a miniature ingot, was taken as inhabitants that he effectively had that power, therefore has confirmation of his status. Since oxide ingot iconography was part of semiotic uh, ideology uh, of Ankumi, whoever saw a miniature ingot immediately knew what the shape and metal stood for, namely what derived from the local economy and social status. The viewer would have been charmed not only by the miniature itself, but also by its owner. In this way, possession of a miniature ingot enabled a person to exercise control over society and over people unable to enjoy the same level of wealth and power. So the person, the, the, this is what happened, might have happened at Ankomi, but uh, what about the remaining two sites, Pila and Alasso? 
So from the archaeological context and their re-examination, the uses of miniature ingots at Alassa and Pila might have been different from Encomi. Both Alassa and Pila do not show traces of oxide ingot iconography, apart from the miniature ingots, of course. Pila pieces, probably the handles of two distinct uh, miniature ingots, were part of a metal hoard uncovered in room uh, 7 plus 41 of complex H. Um, as past and current excavations at the site seem to confirm, metals played an important economic role at the site. Metallurgy was a widespread activity and it mainly consisted of metal smelting and recycling. Although Pila knew full size oxide ingots, it did not produce any artifacts with such iconography other than miniature ingots, which, however, are barely recognizable as oxide ingots, given their fragmentary status. When deposited in the hoard, they were probably not considered prestigious objects or powerful insignia uh, as a tankomy, but raw material stored and uh, ready to be recycled. They were valued for their metal and not for their aesthetic features or miniature qualities. Alassa was the center of a regional polity that controlled the Kuris Valley between the LC2C and the late LC3A when the site was abandoned. The excavations yielded a restricted quantity of metallurgical evidence, indicating that the importance of Alassa was based on something other than copper and metallurgy, most probably agriculture. In this context, the military ingot doesn't seem to have a votive function because the architecture and interior furnishing of the room complex where it comes from uh, are not those usually seen in late Bronze Age Cypriot ritual places. Indeed, the general industrial uh, character of the southern part of the site might call for a more practical and profane function for the ingot, um, probably metal scrap, or the, it has a, an, a symbolical meaning that we cannot understand anymore. So uh, to conclude, this work has examined miniature oxide ingots and reviewed their role in the late, um, in late Cypriot um, uh, Cyprus. Uh, these artifacts represent just a speckle of um, late Bronze Age material culture of the island. However, the reassessment of their archaeological context has shown that we still know very little about them. Despite the existence of full size oxide ingots, no scholar has ever previously attempted to explore the concept of miniaturization and use it to interpret miniature ingots. There exist numerous studies about full-size oxide ingots, but only a few about miniature ones. Perhaps surprisingly, especially given the small size of the artifacts in question, the use of miniaturization theories in the present research represent a new approach to this particular field of study and makes um, this research interdisciplinary. Since we do not have local written sources for late, late uh, Bronze Age Cyprus, anthropological models such as miniaturization can be useful and um, they um, allow to propose a new interpretation of some pieces. Um, the fact that miniature oxide ingots had a different function from full size uh, ones could be clear from the metal composition and the presence of cypriminone signs. Miniature oxide ingots also differs in the treatment of their surfaces, which are not pitted or bubbly, as it happens in the full size um, ingots, um, and for example, in the four size stands. So, had the artisans wanted to reproduce uh, in miniature an actual oxide ingot, they would have had to add also these features. The available data and stratigraphy showed that um, miniature oxide ingots occurred at the same time during the late um, Cypriot to see in three different sites on the island and that circulated until the end of LC3B. This doesn't indicate by all means that they appeared in LC2C, but they, they were probably used in that period. Then the reappraisal of the excavation data indicated that the functions of the miniature oxide ingots different, uh, differed accordingly to the site and probably the people living there and using them. It also emerged that previous studies did not approach, uh, did not adopt an approach able to address uh, the uh, lack of homogeneity of the corpus. Since miniature oxide ingots are not a uniform 
a group of objects um, come from secondary context or do not even have one, it is difficult to attribute the same meaning to all of them or sometimes attribute one at all. Although miniature oxide ingots were an expression of oxide ingot chronography, it doesn't seem to have been a widespread uh, phenomenon on the island. Artifacts characterized by this iconography are limited to only a few uh, LC sites. Econ Encomi uh, shows uh, the highest uh, number of miniature oxide ingots and artifacts characterized by oxide ingot iconography than anywhere else in Cyprus. However, Encomi is also one of the most excavated LC sites and only future excavations and publications would enhance and possibly modify our vision on this topic. Nonetheless, based on the available uh, material evidence, oxide ingot iconography doesn't seem a widespread um, late Cypriot phenomenon, and therefore miniature oxide ingots not have, um, might not have had the same function everywhere on the island. Although we deal with secondary context, the new investigation also reveals that, that each site, and therefore the people living there, might, might have used uh, them differently. Um, Thus, if we exclude the presence of the miniature oxide ingots, oxide ingot iconography, as I said, did not exist as artistic expression at Alassa in Pila. Uh, Pila um, produced no trace of oxide ingot iconography, even though the excavations uncovered full-size ingots and metallurgical remains. The, uh, the archaeological evidence uh, from Alassa did not show either oxide ingot iconography or full-size oxide ingots. Um, interestingly, metallurgy did not play a pivotal role um, in the settlement, and the miniature ingot is the only oxide ingot known at the site. However, both Alasa and Pila were abandoned, therefore we cannot completely exclude that there were more miniature ingots or manifests with oxide ingot iconography, which the inhabitants took uh, with them uh, while leaving the settlements. Um, <clears throat> Although the secondary context uh, do not allow to understand the original deposition and function of these objects, research could shed some light um, of what uh, miniature oxide ingots signified, uh, not when they were first used, but when they were deposited or discarded. As I said, at Pila and also Matiatis, there were metal scraps, uh, part of a founder's hoard. The miniature ingot from Adasa had a more unclear function, uh, it might have been either metal scrap or a more special object for the local population. And in the end, the pieces of evidence from Encomi show that each um, elite might have employed miniature ingots as actual miniatures and according to their need in terms of uh, social display. So proposing different methods and perspectives research aimed to address a gap in the scholarship, besides offering an example for, uh, for the reappraisal of other archaeological material, with the hope that it might encourage other scholars to investigate the past using new approaches. Thank you for your attention. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much, Francesca, for so efficiently summarizing the research of about four years, I think. It's always yes. difficult to summarize a research that, that uh, was a dissertation research in uh, a lecture that lasted less than a, an hour.